right, cool. So today, uh, well, we're going to do several things, but the most important one uh, as far as big names go is uh, the monotone sequence theorem. And with the monotone sequence theorem, what, what are you smiling about? <laughs> Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So the monotone sequence theorem is a theorem that states that any sequence which is both bounded and monotonic is going to be convergent. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So at the end of uh, class yesterday, uh, I started uh, defining bounded sequences. So we defined two kinds of bounded sequences. The first was sequences which were bounded from above. Right? And that was a sequence where, at, for all the terms in your sequence, they were all less than or equal to some number. Right? There was some bound for it on the top. And then bounded from below meant right, there was a lower bound, something which was less than or equal to all the terms in your sequence. Right? And then we also mentioned, uh, though we won't attack this too much further, there was something called the supremum, which was the least upper bound. Right? You might have a... All these upper bounds, right? You know, think of your sequence, a half, a fourth, an eighth, a sixteenth, right? Our favorite one. Okay. We said that two is an upper bound for that right? since it never goes above two. But one is also an upper bound because it never goes above one. And a half is an upper bound because they're all less than or equal to a half. But a half is the least upper bound, right? It's as small as you can go. Okay. Now it's called the supremum. And then on the other side, there's also a greatest lower bound. So for instance, in our sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0 is a lower bound. So is negative 100, but the least or the greatest lower bound is 1. Right? And that was called the enthemum. OK. So uh, there's one more kind I'll mention, uh, which is that if a sequence is bounded from above and bounded from below. And then we call it bounded. Yeah, so it's just bounded. So if it's bounded, uh, then it means it's actually both from above and below. So for example, a half, a fourth, an eighth, and so forth is this bounded? Right? Okay, well if it's bounded, it means it's bounded from above and below. So what's it bounded from above? A half, sure, nothing here is bigger than a half. And what about below? Zero, right? It's always greater than or equal to zero. By the way, what is the least well, we, well, we already answered that. The least upper bound, right, was a half. What's the greatest lower bound? Zero, right? Because if you had a bigger one than zero, you could actually just take a, a high enough power of two to get below that, right? So here, a half was the least upper bound, and that's actually in the sequence. But zero is the greatest lower bound, and that's not in the sequence. So they don't have the, the greatest and least lower and upper bound, they don't have to be in the sequence. But they can be. They don't have to be. OK. Can you think of, let's see, a good sequence which is neither bounded from above or below? Real numbers. The problem with that. In fact, we saw it on one of these Friday sessions. You can't actually write down the real numbers as a sequence. That takes it, for those of you, the, the one of you, <laughs> for you, Jenna, uh, it takes a, a proof that you can't do that. But if you take the real numbers, there's no way to write down, OK, this is the first real number, this is the second, this is the third, this is the fourth, and so on. You cannot do that. You can do it with the rational numbers, though, which is kind of weird. But you can't do it with the real numbers.
So here, well, here's an easy example of a sequence which is not bounded from above or below. You start with 1, minus 1, 2, minus 2, 3, minus 3, and so forth. Okay. What's the, does this sequence converge? All right, what would it look like? It looks like 1, minus 1, 2, minus 2, 3, minus 3, 4, minus, okay, this is, this is wildly diverging, right? It's really, really bad. Okay. And what's happening? Does it have an upper bound? No, because look, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? It just keeps going up. You also have minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4. It just keeps on going down. So this neither is bounded from above or from below. No, infinity, so bounds always have to be real numbers. No. Infinity is not a number. Okay, so, okay, so this, is, this is bounded. Now, um, let me give you a... Yep, yeah, so if you have a constant sequence, then the upper and lower bound equal each other. It's just the, the limit of the sequence, just the same number, right? It's just that constant. Okay. Uh, let me give you another nice example we're going to use more often. Uh, let's look at the following sequence. Uh, we let R be some real number. And we consider... The sequence r to the nth power. Okay, so let me ask an unfair question, which is Is this sequence bounded? Anybody for yes? Why do you say no? So you're saying that if I write down this sequence out, I'm going to notice that it, it keeps going up. Okay, so let me see. Uh, how about r equals 0? So I get 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. That doesn't seem to be going up. Like, what are you trying to do here? Ah, okay. So this thing is it converges, right? And it, it never leaves zero. And it, it's certainly bounded from above and below, right? It's the same bound. So clearly, this this thing is bounded, right? Okay. So then we'll try. Uh, let's set r equal two, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. So clearly, this is not bounded. <laughs> no? Well, I mean, at least it, you, you said it's bound, unbounded from above, but it could be bounded from below for sure, right? Okay, so, so r equal uh, minus 2. Uh, minus 2, 4, minus 8, 16, minus 32, 64. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> Hmm. So these don't even converge. So, of course, well, we know what the ends are doing every time. They just go from 1 to infinity. But this r, r can do some weird stuff, right? right it can be any real number. So, so we may have to break this down into some cases. Right? So can you give me some cases where you know for sure that this thing will Diverge, say, to infinity, maybe. We saw one. When r equals two, that works. r equals one. What happens when r equals one? Let's see. Let's put it here. r equals one. You get one, 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 one. Okay. <laughs> okay, so at zero and one, things are very easy, yeah? OK, 
Okay, so yeah, if you have a number larger than 1, what happens when you take it to a power? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And it starts to get bigger very fast. It's an exponential function. Right? We know that the limit as x goes to infinity, let's just talk about functions for a second, of a to the x is infinity if a is greater than 1. Okay. We all, whenever we did exponential functions, all right, we talked about when a was greater than 1. So in particular, when you just let x, instead of running through all real numbers, going to infinity, just take it at natural numbers n, right. it's going to keep growing. So r to the n goes to infinity if r is greater than 1. OK. Uh, what happens, say, between 0 and 1? Well, I mean, at 0, it's just the constant sequence. At 1, it's the constant sequence. Will it be constant at everywhere between 0 and 1? No, right? OK, you can take, for instance, r equals a half. And then you have that sequence. Right? So what happens if you take a number between 0 and 1 and you take it to a power? What happens to that number? It gets smaller, right? Okay, so we, right, we know if r is a number between 0 and 1, then r to the n is actually smaller than r for all natural numbers n. So it's going to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And in fact, what will happen is Rn is going to go to 0. Oops. R to the n is going to go to 0 if R is between 0 and 1. It's actually true, of course, at zero. So uh, <laughs> now it's still true. Sure. Okay, so we know what's happening between zero and one. We actually know at one what happens, right? It just converges to one. And then once you get past one, it goes to infinity. So that's kind of weird. You start at zero, right? The sequence converges. To 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? All the way up until you get right before 1, it's fine. And then at 1, boom, the sequence converges to 1. And just for that one point is at 1. And then after that, boom, it jumps up to infinity. Hmm? What if r is negative? Say again? How can it diverge to both? Uh, do you mean like it breaks up into one of these these kind of double sequences, right? Where there's a negative part and a positive part, and the negative goes down and the positive goes up? Is that uh, yeah? Okay. So what if we did uh, r equals minus a half? So let's see. It's going to start at minus a half, then it goes to a fourth, then it goes to minus an eighth. Then it goes to a 16th, and then minus a 32nd. What's happening to this thing? Yeah, it's certainly switching between positive and negative, but it's still, from both sides, approaching 0. So this thing goes to 0. And of course, what's happening here is, again, if you're between minus 1 and 0, when you take it to powers, it's going to get smaller in absolute value. Right? So remember yesterday we proved a theorem that says if you want to show that your sequence converges to 0, you can first take the sequence with absolute values everywhere and show that converges to 0. Right? So let's take a look when if, uh, say, R is between minus 1 and 0, then, well, let's look at the absolute value of R to the n. So 
which by the way is the same as the sequence given by the absolute value of r to the n. If r is between minus 1 and 0, where is the absolute value of r? It's between, or we'll put it in numerical orders, between 0 and 1. Right? So, but when you take the absolute value, OK, so you now have a number between 0 and 1, and you're raising it to the n. And we just said, right, if r is between 0 and 1, you raise it to the n, that converges to 0. So this converges to 0. But now by our theorem, if the absolute value of your sequence converges to 0, then your original sequence converges to 0. So this, this theorem is, is, is quite useful. Okay, so that handles the minus 1 to 0 case. Right? Of course, it's also true at 0, but uh, <laughs> we already knew that. Uh, OK, so now the only thing left is anything. Well, let's see. We can put in minus 1. Let's try that. That's kind of an interesting case. What happens at minus 1? Well, you get minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1. Ah, we've seen this one. Right? This diverges. And if it's bigger than minus 1, that is bigger in absolute value, right? So smaller, actually, on the real number line. So it's like minus 2 what happens. Right? Well, then we saw what happens. You get this doubly divergent thing, right? It goes to positive infinity and minus infinity based on which sequence, or subsequence you're looking at. Okay, but in any case, it's divergent. So for uh, r less than minus 1, R to the n diverges, right? and just not even in a cool way, just, <laughs> just bad, bad news bears. Not only does it go to infinity, not only goes to minus infinity, but it also does that whole plus minus business. Yeah, it's as bad as it can get, right? Okay, so this handles all the, the possible cases. So let's try to summarize what's going on here. So. This sequence goes to, well, let's see. We said uh, if you're greater than 1 or less than 1, I mean, or less than minus 1, rather, then it just diverges for sure. Right. So we could say this. This diverges if the absolute value of r is greater than 1. So if you're bigger than 1 or you're smaller than minus 1, it definitely diverges. Okay, that handles this case and this case. Okay. Now, if you're at, uh, what did we say? Between the 0 and 1, where, where, where was our between 0 and, zero and 1, it converges to 0. And if you're between minus 1, and 0, it converges to 0. So this converges to 0 if uh, 0 is less than or equal to the absolute value of r is less than 1. That handles both sides around 0. Okay. OK, now there's only one case left, and that's at 1. And then it converges to 1. Oh, actually, we left out 1. We actually, yeah, we actually left out negative 1, didn't we? OK, so let's add that in there. It diverges when r equals negative 1. All right, that was this last case. OK, so we took care of that case. We took care of uh, this case, oh, which is the same as this case. So now we know if you take any r, we know what's going to happen when you raise it to the n. The special cases seem to be right at, at 1, it converges to 1. At minus 1, it diverges. Right? If the absolute value is bigger than 1, it's going to diverge. 
and if the absolute value is between 0 and 1, it's going to converge to 0. Yep. Okay, Dina, you don't look so happy. Good question. <laughs> so 0 and 1 are the only numbers that have the property that when you raise them to powers, it doesn't change the number. Right? Um, 0 happens to also be the convergence for all these other ones. So that's why it happens to meet it. Right? So I mean, this, this also should be a, a special case, the 0. But because all the other ones converge to 0, you don't have to think of it as a special case. Uh, so, you know, one, zero and one are these special cases. That's basically it. And zero just happens to fit nicely into it. But, uh, yeah, it's because they don't change when you raise them to powers. That's the, the special thing. It's right on the edge. Uh, by the way, uh, sometimes this, this region here, uh, so you, if you put this on a number line, Okay, you got zero in the middle, and you start plotting where this thing is going to converge. Right? And you put, okay, we'll put a one over there, we'll put a minus one over there. We know it converges at one, and it does not converge at minus one, and it converges everywhere in between. Right? And then it diverges outside of this region. Okay, remember the convention, if I use a closed dot, it means it includes the point, if open dot, to don't include the point. So sometimes uh, this region is called the interval of convergence. Although typically this terminology gets used more for series instead of sequences, but you can use it. Uh, and then also the, this, in this nice case here where it's symmetric about a point, um, this distance one is called the radius of convergence. So this has a radius of convergence of 1. The interval of convergence is minus 1 to 1, not including minus 1, but including 1. Yes? Do I plot the limit? Um, do you mean plot the sequence? Or? Oh, yeah, so we're actually going to get to that uh, uh, a little bit later when we talk about generalizing sequences to functions. But, yeah, you, of course, you can graph all of these things in the plane. Right? For instance, let's say I put 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay? And I'm going to plot here my sequence 1 over 2 to the n. When n equals 1, okay, let's say I put 1 up here. Not to scale, of course. Right? There's a half. So when n equals 1, you put a, a point at a, a half. When, when you're at 2, you could put a point at a fourth. 3, you put a point at an eighth. At 4, you put a point at a sixteenth and thirty-second and so forth. Right? So you can graph this. In that sense, you can put the points. Right? Now, most sequences that you could draw down there, there's, there's no nice way to connect the dots. In this case, there is, because there's a nice function underlying it, namely 1 over 2 to the x. And you can just connect it right, by graphing that function. But, uh, yeah, so you can always draw it like this. And, and sometimes it's helpful to see what the limit is. Uh, but in this case, of course, it, we already, it was very easy looking at it to do it also. Okay, any other questions? Then let's move on to probably defining monotonic. Yeah. So monotonic is, is easier than bounded even, although it's harder to write it down, but it's easier. So um, there's going to be two kinds of monotonic sequences, increasing and decreasing. Okay. Function is monotonically increasing if it never decreases. Okay. <laughs> and the function is monotonically decreasing if it never increases. Yeah. Okay, so our one half, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth. Yeah. I guess we have, oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. 
This thing is decreasing. Right? It never will, will increase. So this thing is monotonically decreasing. Okay? Or just decreasing. Uh, if we put down our natural numbers, this thing is increasing. It never decreases. Okay? It just keeps going up. So we call it monotonically increasing. Okay? Now, monotonically actually allows for something else that you don't see in this. Let's say I change the sequence slightly. This sequence no longer always increases. Okay? Increases, 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 stays the same. Okay? Went 5, 5. It did not increase. So this is not an increasing sequence. Increasing sequence would mean it always goes up. Okay? But we still call it monotonically increasing. Okay? So monotonically increasing just says that it never decreases. Does that make sense? Is that, okay? So you're allowed to stay the same. So what a constant sequence, that you would say it monotonically increases, even though it never actually went up. Because it, it's allowed to stay the same as long as it doesn't go down. By the way, you would also say that it monotonically decreases. Because <laughs> okay? it never goes up. So the sequence A n monotonically increases if A n plus 1 is greater than or equal to a n okay, for all terms in the sequence. Okay. And monotonically decreases if a n plus 1 is less than or equal to a n for all terms in the sequence. <coughs> so if either of these two holds, The sequence is monotonic. Okay, nothing bad. So, why is that interesting? It's interesting because of the monotone sequence theorem. Now, uh, I'm actually going to state this theorem slightly different than it's usually stated in a textbook, just because I like uh, to be to be clear uh, as possible here. Uh, and the way it's stated in the textbooks, I think, is too strong. Uh, or maybe too weak. <laughs> so let me tell you how it's going to be stated in the textbooks. Right, so let me first write. We're going to talk about the, the monotone sequence theorem. Okay, we're up to it. So what they're normally going to say is that if your sequence is monotonic and bounded, then it's convergent. Right? Remember, we're, we're really interested in these convergent sequences. Okay? And this is going to give you a way of testing if your sequence is convergent. Okay? It's not the only way. It's not if and only if, but it's going to say, is it monotonic and is it bounded? If it, both of those are true, right? If it always, say, goes up, 
right, or at least never goes down, and it's bounded, then it has to converge. That's what they want to say. But you can write something down that's a, uh, a little easier to test. Right? So this is kind of version one of it. Here's version two, which is if it's monotonically increasing plus bounded from above, then this implies convergence. And, well, we can do the same thing here with decreasing. If it's monotonically decreasing plus bounded from below, this implies convergence. So it's the second two that I want to really think about. Why? What's the difference between saying the first one, which seems like it's much more succinct, than the second two? Well, if you want to show that something is monotonic, you just need to show that it's one of these two, either increases or decreases. Right? Okay, that's, that's actually no different than in one of these two. Right? But bounded, remember what bounded meant? It had to be bounded from above and bounded from below. So now you're only allowed to look at sequences up here that are both monotonic and bounded from both above and below. In these two, you're again, you get to look at monotonic, but you only have to check that it's bounded from one direction or the other. And it just has to be bounded in a compatible way. So if you're monotonically increasing, it should be bounded from above. If you're decreasing, it should be bounded from below. Okay, so this is a little more versatile way of saying it. This is how it's normally written down in the introductory textbook. But if you actually look at a proof in any of those textbooks, if they, if they do supply one, then you're going to see that they actually specialize to one of these cases. And then once they specialize to one of these cases, they only have to use, the, if they're in the increasing, they only have to use bounded from above in their proof. If they're in the decreasing, they only have to use bounded from below. So let's draw a picture just to, to see what's going on. Now, I'm not going to offer a formal proof. Uh, so let's draw, let's see. Let's say we have a sequence that looks <laughs> it's looking like this, and then I have a little guy here. So you, you can see here that, you know, assuming that this followed the pattern, this is a upper bound, an upper bound for this sequence. Right? In fact, we can probably find a better one, right? If we draw a little lower, right? we can probably get one that's even a little bit better. They shouldn't touch it, actually. It's getting closer up to that line. Okay. So it has an upper bound, and it's increasing. It just keeps on increasing. Now think about that. If you have a function which is, say, increasing, it keeps going up. It can't ever stop. I mean, it, well, it can stop. It can't turn her down, though, right? It can't go down. It keeps going up, 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 up. Maybe it pauses for a while, and then it goes up, 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 all right? And it's bounded, so it can't just be doing this, okay? There is some bound. Is it possible that it, it doesn't converge? Right. Well, one of the things you need to prove it is something called the completeness of the real numbers. So we've talked about this a little bit uh, on our Friday sessions. Okay? The completeness of the real numbers is going to tell you that a supremum always exists. Right? So if you have a set of real numbers that's bounded, that there is a least upper bound. Right? And once you get that least upper bound, that's exactly what your sequence is going to converge to. Why? Well, if that least upper bound, your sequence didn't converge to it, well, it can't go above it, so it must be below it. But if it doesn't converge to it, that means that they stay far apart, right? Converging means it gets close and stays close. 
If it doesn't converge, it means it doesn't get close and stay close. Well, staying close isn't a problem because that thing is increasing. It can't jump away again once it gets close. So it must not get close. But then there would be a smaller upper bound, right? You just move it down a little bit. So, okay, so a formal proof is going to have to use the completeness of the real numbers, which is something we uh, are proving in our Friday session. Okay, so, uh, so but you're going to use this in a few places uh, in the homework, for instance, uh, to show that you have a sequence that's going to converge. Right? So you can use it immediately in something like this. This thing decreases, right, monotonically. It's decreasing. It's bounded by zero. Therefore, it converges. That's all there is to it, right? This theorem, you immediately say it. You don't have to say anything else. Decreases. It's bounded by zero. It's converging. By the way, it doesn't tell you what it converges to. Right? But it has to converge to the greatest lower bound in this case, the infimum. Uh, yeah. Let me have till then. Okay. By the way, this, of course, this picture you can flip it and get the, the right picture for this case too. Okay, Dina, ask me a question. Yeah. Oh, okay. So this went way over your head. Okay. So let's let's try to think about this again. I, well, I didn't prove anything in the, in the, with the picture. I, I just give you a, I try to explain it with the picture. I, there's no, I don't write a proof down for this theorem. Uh, maybe I do this on our Fridays. But, uh, so. so if the sequence, you mean? Well, so first, by stop, you don't mean that. I mean, the sequence, is, of course, we, we look at infinite sequences, right? So it keeps going. Ah, okay, so let's say it goes up, 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 and then it becomes constant. And now you're saying, how is it going to get up to this? Okay. So, remember, there's a lot of upper bounds, right? So I'm always interested in the least upper bound. Okay, so I take the least upper bound. Well, let's say this thing became constant. What's the least upper bound going to be? It becomes exactly the number that it, it right, the, the, the constant term that you get, right? Right, so if, if, for instance, if I this thing we say, okay, we all know it's converging to zero. But let's say at some point out here, say one over two to the hundredth, it actually just starts stabilizing. Just stays at one over two to the hundredth, one over two to the hundredth. So you. Well, if you, somebody gives you a sequence, right? Now you you might say, okay, is there? A, you have to ask, is there an upper bound? So let's say they tell you, here's an upper bound. The upper bound for my sequence is seven. Okay, they're not telling you that it's the least upper bound though. They're just giving you an upper bound. The reason is this. This theorem only tells you that it needs to be bounded. Okay? As soon as I tell you an upper bound, that automatically implies, by the completeness of the real numbers, that there is a least upper bound. Yes. This theorem doesn't tell you that it converges to the bound that you're given. It only tells you that it converges to the least upper bound. So I mean, that, that's a sort of a, it, it's hidden in the proof of the statement. And it's usually not written. But in all these cases, what it converges to is the least upper, well, okay. okay. If you're talking about an increasing sequence, it converges to a least upper bound. If you're talking about a decreasing sequence, it's converging to the greatest lower bound. Right? Or in this case, the supremum, and in this case, the infimum. Just big words. Special cases. So, good question. That's a very good question. Okay, so this is going to be very useful when you try to show that a sequence converges. I want to give you another theorem 
that you actually have seen before for functions, which will also be useful. And, and we'll use it to reprove something that we already know. And this might be familiar. Going to the squeeze theorem for sequences. So remember what the squeeze theorem was talking about. For functions, talk about if you had three functions and they were ordered in such a way that one function was always smaller than the rest, one function was always bigger than the rest, and then you had another function that was always right in the middle. And you're moving along and the one, there's stuff on the outside, there's stuff on the inside, and, and I got this guy in the middle, right? And all of a sudden, these two guys on the outside, they start approaching some number, right? Both of them, the one on the bottom and the one on the top, they both approach the same number, right? What has to happen to the guy in the middle? <laughs> right? Because he's always in between them. He gets squeezed. He has to go to that same point, right? Okay. So the same thing is going to happen for sequences. Okay. So let's assume that we have three sequences, a, n, Bn and Cn are our sequences. Such that, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. The greatest lower bound, yeah. Yeah, the enthemum, the nth. That's what they, they usually call this. this. This converges to the nth. Which is short for enthemum, and this converges to the soup for supremum. Not sup, which is what you do at lunchtime. Oh, yeah, and you can, do, yeah, I mean, that's also what I tell people. I say, sup, yo. Okay. All right, so assume we have three sequences such that, okay, what's the such that? Well, there's always one thing that you have to remember about sequences. They can be bad for a long time, right? Remember that was our thing yesterday. They can be bad as long as they repent at the end and are good, okay? So we want these sequences to be ordered, right? So that, you know, say this BN is always in the middle between the AN and the CN. But we allow them to not do that for a while, right? We let them be bad and do all sorts of weird stuff for some amount of time. So let's say that such that there exists a natural number n, right? That's where they become good, right? Uh, there exists such that there exists n and n. Uh, well, again, such that. <laughs> this is a poor sentence. I have too many such that. Uh, such that a n is less than or equal to b n is less than or equal to c n. for all n greater than or equal to big N. So I want that term by term, the sequence satisfies this. But I don't, I don't say that that has to happen always, just once you get to a certain point. Once you get past this bad point, now they always satisfy this. Yeah? So if you're picturing this, okay, this is going to be um, the good, day, you know, good point. Okay, and this is the bad stuff. Okay, so. What's that? Where's the, uh, ah, the good, the bad, and the ugly, yes. Okay, uh, so here, for instance, all right, there's your uh, C, and there's your B, and there's your A. All right, there's another C, another B, another A. And then C might go down, and B goes down, and A comes up. Okay, so you're always keeping the same order, though. A less than B is less than C. Okay, you can't swap it up at any point. But over here, before the good point, you could have C, A, B. Right? They can do nasty things. You could have a, another a B, uh, a C, and an A. They could do just weird stuff. Okay, they can mix and match. But once you get to the good point, that's your N, then they always have to be C, B, A, C, B, A, C, B, A. Okay? Okay, so assume that we have such a thing. Uh, if 
Say that a n converges to some number l. And that c n converges to l. Okay. So this top bit is converging to l, and the bottom bit is converging to l. What can I say about bn in the middle? It's got to converge to L2. Okay, so this is, this is the squeeze theorem for sequences. <coughs> and let's, let's use it to prove this theorem we had on absolute value sequences. So remember, here was our theorem. If a n is a sequence, such that the absolute value of a n, and then, oh, sorry, Dina, um, go on. Is the same thing What's the answer to that question? a list of numbers. Yeah? We don't have to give it a rule. Okay? All the ones that we're going to be looking at in this class, they're always going to be given by a rule. Can't have repeats in a set. Right? And in a set, there, there's no set order to things. Right? If I say the set containing you and Jenna and a chair, there's no what comes first. Okay? I mean, I said you first, but you can list them in any order. A sequence, you, Jenna, chair, right? This is very clear. And I can't, in a sequence, I can have you, Jenna, you, you, chair, you, Jenna, Jenna, you. A set, you can just have you, Jenna, and the chair. Well, like I said, the ones we're going to be talking about, they're not just random numbers, right? I mean, there's something very not random about one half, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth. Yeah. So uh, typically, the the sequences that you know, there's no rhyme or reason to them. If there's no rhyme or reason to them, then they probably weren't interesting to begin with. But we don't we don't want to put a formal restriction into the definition to say, well, we only consider sequences that are interesting. Well, what you're so the well part of the reason, of course, the infinite stuff is happening on the right. Yeah, you're starting on the left with just you have a finite number of stuff and then infinite on the right. But uh, so in math, uh, you know, you're very often interested in long run behavior of something. Right? Something may look very chaotic in the beginning. You have a lot of natural processes, right? For instance, um, I'm sure you've, you've seen something like that. You, if you take a, a coin, right, and you, you spin it in the air and let it drop, a lot of times it will, you know, bounce off the floor and do something weird before it starts spinning in a very nice regular pattern, right? In the beginning, the behavior is very chaotic, but it always gets this nice convergent sort of pattern. So a lot of you've all, everybody you've seen this before. Right? This isn't a silly analogy, right? You've seen this before, yeah. Okay, and then of course, even then that spinning, of course, it eventually you know breaks down and it settles down and do, 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 nice and solid at the end. Okay, so this happens a lot in, in in nature, for instance, that you have processes that are chaotic in the beginning, but have that converge to some nice long run behavior. So this is this is part of the explanation for that. Right. Uh, the other part of the explanation is, is you don't want to, it, it's very difficult to define what you mean by saying, well, I only want to have sequences that are always nice. Right? So if you don't want to try to make that definition, then you have to allow for all possible sequences. And then you need to figure out, okay, what is going to make my sequence one that I want to talk about? What's, what's going to make it nice? And what you decide is, well, okay, you allow for nasty stuff in the beginning, but at some point, some finite term, right, then it has to start 
doing what you need it to do. Well, the stuff at the beginning may very well be random. That could be, right? Well, here's the thing. It's very difficult. I mean, from the human point of view, right, we have difficult deciding what is random and what is pattern. Right? This is already tough. Uh, when I drop this you know, thing on the floor and it moves chaotically at first, this, does, this looks very random to me. Okay? But, of course, there's probably some very good rhyme or reason to everything that's going on. Okay? So that's already tough. But it's very clear once it starts doing that nice tight spiral, you know, that spinning thing, that you know, there's a definite pattern there. Okay? So... Uh, you know, part of it is there's too much sub there's too much subjectivity in the word random at this level. I mean, there is actually you, you can give a precise definition of random too. <laughs> I mean, so uh, sometimes things are going to look random and they aren't. Sometimes things are going to look like patterns and they aren't. And <laughs> these things happen. Yeah, these are this is a good question though. I mean, this is is a very philosophical question almost, but uh, but it's a good one. We can talk more about this. Uh, Okay. All right. So let's uh, let's try to use the squeeze theorem here uh, to prove this statement that we had, which uh, we haven't completely written down again. Which is, if you have a sequence such that the corresponding absolute value sequence goes to zero, then the original sequence converges to zero. Okay. So we already proved this, and if you recall, the way we proved it is we just actually got out the definition of the limit of a sequence, right? We actually used epsilons. That was really nice, right? And remember that the proof actually just came down to the fact that the absolute value of the absolute value was just the absolute value, right? That you, you can't make it more positive. That was the, the whole proof was that. But let's try to prove it using the squeeze theorem. Okay, so this is proof number two. Okay, so the squeeze theorem tells us that if we want to show that Bn converges to zero, then all we have to do is bound it by two different sequences which converge to zero. Right? One from the left and one from the right. Okay? And we already know that, well, let's see, the nth term, we know that that's less than or equal to the absolute value of the nth term. Right? If you take the absolute value, you you always get bigger or equal to. Yeah. And we know that this bit is going to go to zero. All right? That's the assumption, all right? is that that sequence goes to zero. So now all we need to do is bound it on the left side by something, which is also going to go to zero. So what can I put over here that I know goes to zero? I could put zero, but I don't know that these terms are always bigger than or equal to zero. I need a term that I know it's always bigger than or equal to. Negative a n. Okay, now this is almost right. Why is it not right? Well, what if a n was minus two? Then you'd get minus minus two, which would be two. But how can you fix that? Say again. Minus the absolute value, right? Take the absolute value first and then put the minus out there. So first you make it positive, and then right, you toss it uh, around to the negative side. And this is true for all n, right? The squeeze theorem, you just had to, you, you had to at some point it had to, to work. Well, this is, of course, always going to work for any n. Right? So this is for all natural numbers. Okay. Now we know that that goes to 0. What about this thing? Why does it have to go to zero? Well, yesterday, we had these nice laws for limits. Right? And one of them said that if you take a sequence and multiply it by a constant, right, and we start with a convergent sequence, then the, what it converges to just gets multiplied by that constant. Well, in this case, we have a sequence, a n, that convert, a n, well, absolute value of a n, that converges to 0. And now we multiply it by a constant. What constant? Negative 1. So this will converge to negative 1 times 0, which is still 0. So that sequence converges to 0. And so by the squeeze theorem, a 
an converges to zero. Yeah, so, so very easy. Okay, so uh, on the the new homework, which by the way there is a new homework up on the the web I put up there yesterday. Uh, <laughs> not due this Friday. Just <laughs> not worried. Uh, there is there is for instance a problem on there that says use the squeeze theorem to uh, to show that something converges. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, the trick, of course, is in finding these two sequences. Right? If you have a sequence, then and you say, oh, I want to show it how it converges using the squeeze theorem, you need to find these two sequences. And that's that's the real trick. Right? That's the fun part. That's what's gonna keep you up at, at night. Okay, let's see, what's next? Uh, oh yeah, we're on to the the last little bit. So let me Oh yeah, yeah, please. Is zero considered a constant? Is zero considered a constant? Is one considered a constant? Is five considered a constant? Do you mean if I had zero less than or equal to a n? So this is uh, Leith had asked this, right? And what's the problem? What's the problem? What if a n is negative? Then I can't write zero less than or equal to a n. Because it's negative, right? I said an is negative five. Well, zero is not less than or equal to negative five. No, 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 you cannot ask too many questions. Three too many, but. So what, what I said is, if you have a sequence that converges to zero, all right, or as, if you have a sequence that converges, and you multiply it by a constant, then that new sequence will converge to that sequence of original convergence times that constant. Right? Now, this sequence converges to something. Okay? Forget that it converges to zero. If you multiply it by zero, then you'd get a zero. It would also converge to zero. That's true. Right? There's nothing different. I mean, what you're saying, you're wondering, does that, does that limit law work when c is zero? The answer is yes, it still works. Right? And why does it work? Well, for instance, if you take a sequence and multiply by zero, that means you multiply every term by zero. So your new sequence is zero, 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 zero. Okay? So it certainly converges to zero. Why doesn't... Why can't you put zero here, though? Okay. The reason why is because even though you're looking for a sequence that converges to zero, you're not allowed to put down here something which isn't true. Right? You still need it that every single term must be less than or equal to the corresponding term in the sequence. Exactly. It may not be, right? An could be minus two. That's, that's what's going on. No, no. If you, if they always say, if you're asking a question, then somebody else is thinking the same thing. Although, I always thought if I was asking a really good question, that maybe, maybe that was beyond what everybody else in the class was, you know, thinking. It was, you know, I mean, there's always the smartest person, right? And if they're asking the smartest question, then odds are they're the only one asking it, right? It doesn't work that way on the other side, though. If you're asking the dumbest possible question, there's a very good chance that even smart people might be asking the same dumb question. Whatever a dumb question is. You know what they say. There are no stupid questions, just stupid people. I don't mean to look at you as I say that. I <laughs> okay, now... Uh, uh, I don't remember where it is or it was now. Oh, it's right. There's one of them. Okay. Uh, given the pattern of this sequence, there's at least an outside chance that this is modeled by a function, right? If there's some continuous process at work here, right, there might be a function which is doing this, something like that. Okay. 
Could this be the square root of x? Minus 1? Could it be any of those? Why could it not be? What's the, what's the limit as x goes to infinity of the square root of x? Infinity, yeah? This thing just keeps, you take big, big numbers, square roots are going to become big, big numbers too. This thing has a, a nice limit, right? This thing is bounded. <laughs> At the beginning, right? Yeah, the beginning is starting to look like it, but then it does this little turn here. Sure, why not? Sure, sure. Maybe, uh, sure, sure. I mean, because a sequence can be anything you want, what if we define a sequence like this? Let's start with a piecewise defined function and build a sequence from it. Okay, okay so I'll take, uh, how about, 2 to the x when x, we're just going to define this po on positive stuff. Uh, 2 to the x when x is greater than or equal uh, to 0, uh, or uh, let's say 1. Let's say 1. Let's keep everything natural. Okay. Uh, but less than or equal to 2. It's equal to 4 uh, when 4 is greater than or equal to x is greater than or equal to 2. And it's equal to, I don't, know, I don't make things too complicated. Uh, how about x plus 6 when x uh, is greater than 4? Am I allowed to do that? Am I allowed to evaluate the function using two different formulas for the same point? If they equal the same number. So in this case, I got lucky, right? 2 to the 2 is 4. 4 is 4. Okay, so it's okay. But strictly speaking, right, it's not good form to actually write it like that. Yeah. It's true what I wrote, but it's not good form. Good question. Okay. Now, from this function, I'm going to build a sequence. Okay. I'm going to define f sub n. I need to tell you what the nth term in the sequence is. Fn is just going to be my function f of n. Okay. So f1 right, is f of 1. Now f of 1 I evaluate up here. Right, and I get 2 to the 1, which is 2. f2 is f of 2, which we now know is 4. <laughs> f3 is f of 3, which is, well, when x is 3, you get the value 4. f4 is f of 4. Again, you get a 4. f5 is f of 5. Right? Okay, so it's 5 plus 6, which is 11. Right. So it's what's it going to look like? Our sequence is going to be 2, 4, 4, 4, 11. Okay, then you're just going to add 1 each time. Right? So 12, 13, 14, and so on. Yeah? The numbers have to be in. Do you mean that these are going up? Yeah. No, no, I mean, what if I did this? Right. So now when you got to 5, f of 5, it would be 5 minus 6, which would be minus 1. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, I'm, I'm giving a, I'm giving, I mean, you can take any, if you have a whole bunch of different functions, okay? Uh, as long as you're, you're not trying to define for the same value, you know, in two different ways. Uh, my, what I mean is, let's say you have the function 2 to the x and the function 4, right? As long as I'm not trying to assign values for one 
with both of these functions, okay, which you're not allowed to do, right? Um, you can always build a piecewise defined function, and then get a sequence from that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you, that, so the way that from a function that you build the sequence is you just say, well, I want to know what the nth term in the sequence is. I can just put n into my function. Yeah? What can we say? Is the sequence divergent? Right? Because what happened? Well, okay. This, remember, we'll go back to the x plus 6 version. Once you get past, once you're in this seg segment, right, where x is greater than 4, right, the nth term is just going to be n plus 6. So, of course, n goes to infinity, so will n plus 6. So this will diverge to infinity. Plus 6. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this last bit, and I, you'll have to mull over the weekend for a little bit, this ability to take a sequence out of a function Right? Of course, you can kind of do this backwards sometimes. Right? Let's say I have the sequence 1 over n. Right? Can I get a function that I know is going to give me that sequence? What's the function? 1 over x. Right? This is going to correspond to f of x equals 1 over x. Okay? So then the question is going to be, if I want to know something about these sequences, can I look at properties of this function. And maybe that's going to be a little bit easier because these are very discrete, right? You have a1, a2, a3, a4. But this is a nice continuous function, at least away from zero. Right? And this is how we're going to get calculus back into the 